Hi everyone. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> My name's Claire, and so today I will be talking about using biochemical markers to investigate the hidden lives of planktivorous elasma ranks. Basically, I chose the cute spotty fish. <laughs> um, so uh, I, uh, my base is in Mozambique, uh, in Tofu. This is my office. It's really horrible. I work with the Marine Megafauna Foundation, and I think some of you know my supervisor, Dr. Simon Pierce, the lovable Kiwi. Um, I also work with the University of Southampton uh, very recently, and uh, working with the National Oceanography Centre specifically. Um, so I know, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what a whale shark is. Um, but I'm just going to quickly go over some things you might not know. So, uh, whale sharks are distributed in tropical and subtropical waters um, across the world. Um, they're the biggest fish in the sea. They um, are traditionally known for their coastal aggregation behaviour. So there are certain hot spots uh, around the world, um, but most of them in, I'll be talking about are in the Indian Ocean. Uh, specifically in Mozambique, Tanzania, Djibouti, and in fact there are more uh, hotspots being discovered all the time as people, I guess, colonise colonize the coast more. Um, what's <coughs> interesting about the Indian Ocean populations is that they pretty much all show size and sex segregation. So all of these uh, coastal aggregation sites are actually predominantly made up of the young, immature males, so all the teenage boys hanging around at the beach. Um, this is uh, one of the other things about the whale sharks is that although we know them for their coastal aggregation behaviour, typically this is only for a few months of the year um, at each of these locations. So these actually pose a few problems for researchers. We are very, very unsure um, about what the behaviour of the mature adults is like, especially the females. Um, we really don't see very many young sharks. I think. Uh, very recently in the last few weeks uh, we saw a shark that was about two, two and a half metres long and that is, I believe, from Andrea who's been there for over ten years, that is the smallest whale shark that's ever been seen there in the last ten years. Mm -hmm. So as they're born at about 50 centimetres long we really are missing uh, the, both the low and the high end of the uh, demographic here. Um, we also, because they're only really around these coastal sites um, between, I guess, three and six months of the year, depending on where you are, uh, we have no idea where they go after that or what they do. Um, they're very, very large, they're very highly migratory, and this means that we really are not getting the full picture of what these guys are doing. So, we have tried to take a different approach and using all these new ecological tools, um, we're sort of using the are what you eat principle. Uh, so this is really how fatty acid analysis and stable isotope analysis works. I'll be covering both <coughs> very briefly, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, hopefully, uh, for my PhD project, I'll be trying to combine the two to get a bit of a holistic view of what's going on. So, they, like I said, they both work on the principle of you are what you eat. So, the, what the uh, predators are actually eating um, affects what, uh, what goes into their tissues. So you can, in terms of fatty acids, uh, it works very well, you can actually get quite a, sometimes quite a, a sort of small scale view of what they're eating. So predators cannot uh, synthesize certain fatty acids themselves and therefore we know that they come directly from their diet. And by comparing the uh, profiles of the prey and the predator, you can get quite a good idea of either exactly what they're eating or a very good breakdown of what they're eating. Um, in terms of stable isotopes, I think Johannes uh, touched on this as well, but I'll go over it again. Um, you can look, by looking at different stable isotopes, classically in marine ecology we use uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes. Um, these vary fairly predictably over, over latitudes, um, so ocean basin scales. They vary over depth, so the surface and sort of uh, mesopelagic zones will have different, different ratios. Uh, they vary of ecosystems, so you can look into uh, diet shifts as well, and specifically nitrogen uh, varies over trophic level levels fairly predictably as well. So you can start to get a really good picture about what they're eating and where they're eating, which is the idea. The benefits of using stable isos and fatty acids are that you can get a really large sample size very, very quickly. 
Um, for example, for the whale sharks, I think last year we got 60 plus samples in a few months. And when you sort of compare that to the identified population, which is about 600, 650 at the moment, you're kind of getting towards something which is becoming an acceptable representation of your population. Um, they're time integrated as well. So um, while using, it's usually better to use these in conjunction with uh, necropsies and uh, techniques like this. Um, these sort of stomach content analysis, the um, really produce a very specific snapshot of the diet of these individuals. So you're really just getting their last meal, um, which often doesn't tell you a great deal about what they're eating the rest of the time. Uh, for whale sharks specifically, um, we only really get stomach content analysis when the whale sharks get washed up somewhere. Um, <coughs> quite a few of ours we've got from Jeremy, thanks. Um, and this is because they're getting washed up on shore, really what they've been eating is been the sort of surface of plankton right at the coastal areas. And then we don't have an idea of what else they're eating as well. They're relatively inexpensive. So um, analyzing them, I'm going to go in, uh, I'm going to try and convert it to rand. So for one sample, it costs about 140, 150 rand for a sample. And then when you compare this to the $4,000 you're spending on one tag, um, it starts to look really good. Um, so another uh, really, really good benefit about this, especially for whale sharks in particular, is that it's really minimally intrusive and it's non-lethal. So we don't, uh, not like it happens very often, but we don't sort of get specimens from trawlers. We don't wait for opportunistic strandings, which don't happen very often. Um, but also for species which are sort of vulnerable and protected, you really don't want to be killing them to do your research. So. Uh, this, this is a really a good benefit as well. Um, unfortunately, there are drawbacks. Uh, both stabilised open fatty acid analysis, especially in marine ecology, is relatively new. There's still a lot of things we don't know, which means that interpretation of these results can be a little bit subjective, unfortunately. Uh, there are some things you do really have to consider. Uh, for stable isotopes, you have to know about tissue turnover rates. So you have to know what scale, time scale you're working on. Uh, for example, the, you can imagine that the metabolic turnover rate for blood and liver tissues is a lot faster than muscle or skin. So you have to know what time scale you're looking at so that you can um, interpret your results correctly. Um, unfortunately for tissue turnover rates, they're incredibly specific to species. So at the moment, I think the closest uh, a controlled feeding experiment that's been done to have a look at this was in leopard sharks by Kim et al in 2012. So that's really the closest thing I have for my study, which isn't ideal, but you kind of have to work with what you have. Uh, for fatty acids, it's a similar story as well. You need to know things like synthesis and fractionation. So you need to know how these animals are processing these fatty acids once they get into their body and then how they store them in different tissues as well. Uh, you can imagine the storage in muscle, the storage in skin, they're not going to store them exactly the same way in these lipid deposits. So you have to, again, have an idea of how they store which fatty acids where before you start making assumptions. Um, and then because this is a relatively new area for marine ecology and especially Elizabeth Branks, um, we really don't have very much uh, baseline data. Uh, this is stable isotopes have been traditionally used really in land-based um, uh, research. And so for North America, it's brilliant. You have these, this beautiful map with very well-defined lines and you can pretty much tell to the mile where this bird has flown or where this marmot has been or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, the ocean, by nature, is fluid. It makes, <laughs> it makes these things a little bit more difficult. Um, but there's, it's very, very changeable, and it, it's very, very hard to have very, very defined areas. Um, so if uh, a whale shark, for example, left tofu, uh, put on a jacket, and went all the way down to Antarctica, uh, we should be able to tell that, but it's very, very difficult at the moment because you don't have very, very good values um, across these. Uh, latitudes to be able to tell these things exactly. Um, there's also just a general lack of studies on elasma branks. It's getting a lot better. People are publishing more work on this, but it's uh, considering things like urea retention and how that would affect the nitrogen levels in different tissues. And it's all these little little things that you have to consider, especially for for the sharks and rays, um, which uh, we're still learning about at the moment. So the uses that uh, I have here. 
Um, Johannes touched on this as well. The sort of carbon isotopes and nitrogen isotopes are traditionally used for this kind of research. Um, carbon is more of where you've been eating, so it's set by the baseline levels um, at the base of the food chain, and it doesn't really change very much once you go up the trophic levels, so you can really kind of get a good idea about where these animals have been uh, and what they've been eating there. Uh, the nitrogen is mostly for trophic level and sort of food web uh, research, so you can, uh, the nitrogen gets more enriched, so you get more of the heavy nitrogen-15 as you go up the food chain, so then you can start positioning animals and getting an idea of where they are in the food chain, where they are in their food web. You can, once you start knowing where these animals are going and uh, how, what they're eating, you can then start to look into slightly more complicated things like habitat use. If they're spending more time in one area than another, this will show up in the fatty acids and stable isotopes because they'll be eating more in certain areas than others. You can look at residency. I mean, it, just because we don't see the whale sharks in the coastal areas, they might literally just be at, you know, a two k's off. We can't see them. They might be very resident and they're just next to us. We just can't see them. Or they might be just going straight off into the middle of the Indian Ocean, spending all their time there. We can have a start having a look at these values and seeing which one of these might be true. Um, a slight side aside to my project is hopefully going to have a look at niche partitioning. Um, we're very lucky in Tofu because we're one of the only places in the world where we get whale sharks and both species of manta rays, the giant manta and the reef manta, all using the same habitat at the same time. Um, so uh, something I'm going to try and look into is comparing these values across all the three species and see if there is sort of niche partitioning in this very small area. Um, Obviously, everybody wants to look into the uh, sex and ontogenetic onto effects, whether habitat use or diet, diet, you get dietary shifts as the size of the sharks changes. And another thing that I want to do is have a look at a uh, bit of a more of a worldwide analysis and step back and um, look at everybody else's populations of whale sharks as well as, well, as, well as our own. So uh, the way we do our sample collection is fairly straightforward and delightfully cheap again. Hooray. So we just use a modified, uh, a modified Hawaiian sling, so it's a sort of spear fishing pole, you can kind of see the elastic on the end. And then we have sort of tips that we have a modified adapters for. They're about 10 centimetres long or so, and we really we aim pretty much the same place that everyone else uses to tag sharks, sort of just below, just below the dorsal fin on either side. We try and go in between, I don't know if you can see the ridges on the whale shark, those are actually quite hard, we try and aim between those. And just, just get basically a core of tissue, uh, which for us is actually all connective and skin. We don't actually end up getting any red muscle, which is another problem, unfortunately. Um, so this is relatively easy, and I would say from, I don't have any stats on this, but from personal observation, I would I'd go ahead and say about 90% <coughs> of the time, they don't even know you're there, let alone react. It's great, pretty but dumb, it's awesome. <laughs> um, so these are the proposed locations I have, other than Tofu and Mozambique, which you can see a little spot at the bottom there. Uh, I'm working with uh, several uh, other researchers uh, around the world and hoping to do some pretty worldwide collaborations with these guys as well. Because this uh, tissue sampling is really easy and really cheap, it means that people are much easier to convince <laughs> to get involved in this kind of thing. So as well as looking at the Indian Ocean, I'm hoping to have a look on the Pacific side as well. Um, I think it's going pretty well so far. I think if I've got samples from uh, Mozambique, Tanzania, Qatar, and the Philippines, and that's probably, between the three of them, it's up to like 180 or so samples. So I'm really psyched because I think the last, uh, I think the last uh, project that's looked into stable isotopes and whale sharks was Burrell um, outside of India, and I think his sample size was nine. So we're doing really well. I think that's plus Ryan's stuff, and we're doing really well, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm quite glad this is going well so far. If anyone wants to give me any whale shark bits, again, that would be great. Um, what I'm also going to present now, um, because I was hoping to present uh, some initial results from my own data, but there's been a bit of a hiccup with the lab. This is one of these curveballs we were talking about. Um, so I'm going to present uh, very briefly some of the results by Chris Rona. I actually worked uh, with him, as in I collected most of the samples for him for this uh, initial study on uh, whale sharks looking specifically at fatty acid analysis. Um, so the outline of his project was to look at both Mozambican and South African sharks. Um, 
He collected the subdermal connective tissue in the same way that I described before. I think he had 24 individuals in the end. He collected surface zooplankton and sort of deep, deeper zooplankton off the shelf break. He also had five stomach contents. Again, thank you, Jeremy, for some of those. Uh, and um, he compared these to some already published fatty acid uh, sort of results from other, from potential and published prey species of the whale sharks. Um, he also used a technique where he used mixed models, so he basically made up about five fake diets of the whale sharks and had different, uh, different prey items in different proportions to see whether that would match up. Um, it makes sense for these uh, really large and micro species, they probably just don't eat one thing, so it, it makes sense to have a look at some uh, combined species. Okay. Um, just the results really quickly. So the coastal zooplankton didn't match the fatty acid profiles of the sharks at all. Um, they did, in the stomach contents, they did see some demersal zooplankton. Uh, so this is zooplankton that generally lives in the sort of sand and sediment during the day and then comes up at night time. Uh, this was backed up by some bacterial fatty acids that we found in the shark. So this may have been gotten through this detrital link here. Uh, the one uh, dietary mix that seemed to group well with the whale sharks was the was, uh, Chris included um, all the prey that were within 40% similarity of the whale sharks for the initial analysis. And um, he, they also grouped together fairly well with some meso and bathypelagic uh, plankton as well. Um, this is just uh, to show quickly that the sort of whale sharks are uh, basically on that blob on the right and then all the surface plankton is on the left. So clearly, even though whale sharks have been observed eating coastal zooplankton at, at the surface, it's not really their main dietary source. And this is a very scary graph that <laughs> took me hours to understand. But basically, it was just to show that these are the whale sharks here. They really don't group well with any of these prey species on their own, but this orange dot in the middle was the dietary mix of uh, all, the, all the prey species which were in within 40% similarity here. So basically what that means is that because whale sharks are very large, they're very migratory, and they have a very work in a very patchy food environment in these tropical ecosystems, um, the whale sharks clearly forage during the day because we've seen it. Um, they, it looks like they forage at night and it looks like they eat these mistids or uh, this uh, zooplankton that sort of comes up from the sediment at night. Um, and they do have links to both pelagic and deep water zooplankton as well. So they're very, uh, they do eat an, in or use uh, several different ecosystems as well as these coastal ones. Um, however, these samples were limited, the stomach contents were limited, so we can't really generalise. We only had uh, samples from Mozambique and South Africa. Um, so this is just really a good platform for me to do my work on top of this as well. Um, however, this is, very, this is very exciting news because whale sharks may actually play a part in some, uh, some nutrient cycling because they eat and spend time in so many of these different, uh, so many of these different areas. They may actually contribute quite quite a great deal to this. Um, so this is good stuff to work with. This is just a shopping list, a Christmas list, <laughs> really. So uh, as well as the fatty acid and stable isotope work, I really hope to do some acoustic tagging as well. Um, so for the fatty acid and stable isotopes, you really don't need very much tissue. So if anyone happens to come across a whale shark, it would be really nice if you could give me a call. I'll be handing my card out shamelessly later. Um, <laughs> Also, there is a possibility um, of doing some ontogenetic or diet switching work where I'll be using the whale shark vertebrae and actually taking samples from, from the center all the way out to the side. And this is a, some sort of a way of getting around the fact that we don't really see any juveniles or adults. We can actually just look, um, we can take uh, samples from their spine and get nice sort of time, nice sort of, uh, I guess, timelines from that and do some isotope work on that as well. Um, again, Anyone sees a dead whale shark, it would be great if I could have some connective tissue, some red muscle tissue, some blood, and some liver samples, and maybe an eye, if you feel like throwing that in there as well. That would be great. Um, that, that work, like I mentioned earlier, would be really awesome as well, because it means I can start getting a diet idea of tissue turnover um, for these different sharks and start getting an idea of actually what I'm looking at. It would be great. Um, and I, I think that's it, pretty much. Thank you. <laughs>